Hey guys, welcome to Slash Rex Games. Today I'm going to be finally demystifying the HTTP DLL2 uh, movement client and server. And to do so, I've got the server on the left and the client on the right, so we can see everything on the screen at all times. And then we've also got um, the actual website here with all the documentation that we're going to be referring to whenever a certain functional section requires further explanation. We can just head to that. All right. Um, so, if you tried to import the legacy versions of the movement client and server into Studio, you would have run into several problems such as um, Studio has its own uh, networking functions that use the word buffer, so now that is a reserved word. So the new Studio extension uses hbuffer instead of the word buffer, so you would have had to change all instances of the word buffer to hbuffer. That was a big thing. Then another thing is if you go into object controller you would have noticed that socket connect socket address port false has an extra argument that the functions in the studio extension don't have I'll show you how to fix that too so firstly we're gonna go into the extensions we're gonna import one right over here we're going to find exactly where we've got that find it over here 2.3 go into that Got the C++ in the GM folder, go into the GM folder. Notice nothing pops up here unless you set the correct extension. It's a legacy um, extension over there. Studio has Studio at the end, the 8 version doesn't. Get that in. Once you've included that, scroll all the way down to socket connect. Right over here. See so over here in the help it says socket connect has an ID, address, port, and local. And here at the bottom here it says there's only three arguments, whereas here in the help, there's four. So you need to add, click the plus, change argument three from a string to a double. Okay. Click OK. And before you do anything, save your project. Control S. Once that done, go into Object Controller, into Create. There we go. You notice there are no errors here anymore. So now you are well on your way to getting this to work. Okay, click OK. Check all this way. So the way I'm going to be doing this is, firstly, I'm going to go through everything in the client, then I'm going to go through everything in the server, and I'm going to show you exactly how it works. In the end, we're going to be throwing things around, showing you how it goes from left to right and right to left, and how the connections are made. So in the controller over here of the client, notice there is, well, three objects in this client. There is one controller, one local player, and one remote player. So in every room where you want, you know, networking to happen, where you want information to be sent and received, you got to have object controller. Then local player, this is the player that the, the person playing the game has control of, and he sees many different object remote players. Right? So there can be very, there can be a lot of object remote players in the game, depending on how many people have connected to the server. And each one will have their own remote player, whereas the player will have only one local player. So in the game, we'll have one controller, one local player, and as many object remote players as there are other people on the internet playing the game. Just like that. So in the object controller, going into the create at the top here, we are creating some temporary variables. Remember that the controller is going to be changing variables on behalf of the local player right up here. Because in the local player, in the server event, it just has movement controls. It doesn't send its own stuff. It does nothing for itself. All it does is move around. And then the controller picks up this movement and sends it to the server. So everything is done on behalf of the local player and the remote player. Okay, so back here, in the create of the object controller on the client, we've got some variables, address, name, port. These variables will be assigned to the local player. That's why they are temporary. And you know, because this controller is going to be handling the local player as well as the remote player, we don't want any of these variables to actually stay with this controller, otherwise it's going to get bloated with all kinds of stuff. So it's temporary. Once this create event's finished, these variables will be deleted, and um, yeah, they'll be deleted. They'll be cleared up. So we've got three temporary variables, address, name, and port. We're getting the address from the player through a string. Notice it's just the... Uh, loopback address 127001 I'm going to get into the different IPs the local IP then you've also got your external IP given to you by your ISP and I'm going to tell you exactly how or how and when you need to use each one depending on if the server is on your local network or if it's somewhere on the other side of the world I'll show you how to do that in the next tutorial when we handle some port forwarding then we're going to get the name from this uh, from the player simple string and here it's going to say well do you want to use the delay server press no if you don't know what that means we're always going to just push no for now over there we're going to be using this port. Then here we're creating a socket. We are connecting 
using the socket connect function to connect this socket to that address and that port. Then here the extra argument called false. If you look down here at the bottom, it says um, ID address port local. Or do we want to just connect to a local server? So now, if your game is going to just be on the same network, you're playing amongst some friends who come over for a LAN, then you can set that to true. But if you set it to false, it means that this client will try to connect to any server, including ones on the other side of the world. So it's best to just leave this to false, because then it can connect to both. Then down here we've got global buffer equals hbuffer create, so we're creating a buffer. So this is like a a big chunk um, of information. Um, well, it's a, it's a space for where information will be pushed into um, and appended to, so that when we are ready to send it, we just send the buffer, and then the server can um, sort out what parts of information go where. Then we're saying, well, we haven't connected yet. Um, then we are setting up some delay stuff. Don't have to worry about that. Play ID on start is zero. We're creating this object local player randomly around the room and we're giving it the name that the player typed in right over there. Then we're sending stuff. First we're clearing the buffer, make sure there's no information in that buffer. Then we're writing a an assigned integer with the value 1. Then we are writing a string of the value name and then we're sending that message through to the server. Right, That's what the create event does. It's pretty simple. This is the manner in which we'll be sending and receiving data using hbuffer write and um, hbuffer read. Right? That's the way it works, reads and writes. It's pretty simple. So that's the create. If we go into the step event, over here again, we are setting temporary variables, s, a, x, x, uh, y, y, h, s, v, s. And this is the delay stuff again, don't worry about that. Every step of the game, the local player is going to be clearing the buffer. It's going to write a value to unassigned integer with value 2 to the server then it's gonna it's got a width block over here that's gonna check out some variables of the player it's gonna say if ID isn't equal to other ID right so if the player ID isn't equal to the other ID on the server side then it's going to write the X the Y the H speed and the V speed all of which are float 32s right that's quite a big piece of data there because you know X and Y pixels they have points and stuff they all floating points so that's what we'll need to do. Then eventually after we've grabbed all that information and we've appended it to the buffer, then we're going to write the message to the socket and we um, attach in the global buffer once that's done. Then before you want to read certain information from the server, you always have to call socket update read and then you put in the socket over there. Then after that you have a while loop over here that says, well, while we can read messages on the socket and that buffer, we're going to grab the first character, notice that this 2 here and these unsigned integers, this is like a tag. We are sending little numbers and when those little numbers get to the other server, the server is going to say, well, if I receive a 2, then I'm going to update the player's positions. If I see, receive a 1, then I'm starting a new player and creating a, a new player object on the server side, that kind of thing. So the very, very, very first piece of information you send is always going to be an unsigned integer, um, an 8-bit unsigned integer, and it's going to have a number, and the server is going to do this sort of thing. It's very similar to the client here. It's going to first extract that unsigned 8-bit integer from the buffer, then it's going to switch on it saying, well, if it's a 1, we're getting, for instance, in this case, player ID. If it's a 2, we're moving the remote players. If it's a 3, we're creating a remote player. If it's a 4, we're destroying the remote player, and then at the end, it cuts that off. That's the end of the switch, and that's the end of the while. So there we go. That's that's really, really simple. So this part here is going to be getting a message from the server side, and it's going to be um, doing you know, whatever it needs to do with that message, depending on the very, very first unsigned integer that it receives. So that's the very first thing you send. Then here at the bottom, we've got S equals socket get state. If we go into documentation, go into sockets, we're going to find get state. I think it should be... Uh, right here, get state. A state of zero is not connected. We don't have zero, we've got s equals two, four, and five. Put that over there. So two is connected. So here we say, well, if we get a, an s, if, if s equals two, and we're not currently connected, then, well, now we are connected. That's what it's saying. If we get a four, it means that it's closed, the connection has been closed. So in this case, it says connection closed, game end, just like that, and then exit. 
if s equals 5 or socket get right dollar length here we go of the socket is greater than max right dollar length now you wonder what this max right dollar length is because we haven't explicitly created um, such a variable anywhere over here you go to can we just x that for now go to resources to find constants over here it says constants notice that it has a value of max right data length 4000 right over there so we're creating that constant so whenever we need to compare um, how much data we're getting and if the data is too much or something's very very wrong then it's going to compare it to this and say well no it's greater than 4000 something is wrong so we're going to get uh, this number 4 we're going to say that you know connection is definitely something's gone horribly wrong this is just to reduce the amount of magic numbers we've got floating around so we're defining a constant to do that go back to step yeah, open this up scroll down back down to here so that was five and you know if that happens it's gonna say well reset the socket um, if we were connected say that now we're not connected for some reason if we weren't connected then obviously we couldn't connect to the server because it has timed out and then here's some other delay stuff don't worry about that for now click OK in the end step you always need to have an end step with the object controller because this needs to update the write after we've done reading we need to say okay well now we are gonna do the writing and that's where it sends off stuff and then when the game ends destroy the socket destroy the buffer right over there and draw this thing is just gonna draw the remote players and the local players because at the present they don't have any sprites you know, he just draws little circles and stuff it looks pretty cool actually so yeah he draws the local player in green with the name um, so he draws a circle next y and that all updates and then all the remote players are all red with their name and it also has their IP I think click OK OK so that's done so let's now jump into oh wait let's first go into the local player it just does some movement code see because the object controller does everything for the local player and the remote player this remote player has some initialized variables here all set to naught and the end step it just sets its x and y depending on what it's been given and in the room we've just got over here what is this this is the controller every room that you want to communicate with the server has to have object controller if it doesn't have object controller then everyone else will just will no longer see the the player they will not you know it will no longer get updates and that so make sure you've got that object controller in every room that needs to communicate with the server okay so that is the client now if you don't know exactly know what's going on it doesn't matter you probably shouldn't We've just gone through it so that when I go through the server, you'll kind of get an idea of how things work. And then lastly, I'm going to be going through backwards and forwards how everything works. So we've got the controller, we've got the object player. Notice on the server side, everyone's a player. There is no remote player, you know, because the service is running. And in the same fashion, the controller does everything for the player to an extent. So here we've got the controller. It creates. To start it off, it starts listening. So it's listening. It's running. It doesn't care if no one ever joins and it's alone. It doesn't matter. It's just listening. It's always there um, and basically it creates a listening socket create here uses this function gets this ID called listening socket then it starts listening at that socket um, IPv6 is false so it's IPv4 um, so it's going to accept any address for example our 127001 loopback address it's going to accept that on this port 39083 again I'll be going through port forwarding in the next tutorial and here again we've got local equals false so this server can listen to you know connections coming from the internet also and as the client did, did it creates a global buffer using hbuffer create gets the ID to that buffer it's counting the steps and it starts player ID count at zero so every player that joins will get an ID first guy will get a zero next guy will get one two three four it's always going to be incremented by one and we're going to use that ID to um, tell well the server is going to be using that ID so that it correctly updates the, the data coming from the other players so it can send other data to the clients and update remote players specifically on their ID in our step right over here we're saying well again two temporary variables because this controller is working on behalf of the player so it doesn't want to hold on to any of these variables when this event is finished it's going to delete them and then the next person that joins is going to create another two temporary variables a and name etc so we increase the step counter because one step's passed, so that's going to keep going up. While we're able to listen on that socket, right? it means that when it gets to do this code, it means it's accepted, um, it's accepted a connection from a player. It's going to increase the ID by one. It's going to create some stuff here. Notice that we created the temporary variable, then we're assigning 
this object player to this variable. So this is like a pointer. So if we give this little variable any information, it's going to be giving it to this object player. So in this case, we are creating a socket, a dot socket equals socket create. So we're giving that player a socket. Then we are accepting it on our listing socket and players socket. Then we are getting the IP here for this player. Socket get peer address, a dot socket. We're getting the IP address of that socket. Then we are setting the ID, the player ID of this object player to the ID counter that was set up over here. Then we're setting its name to nothing. Then we're sending its ID back to the client. We're clearing the buffer to do this. Then we're writing our unsigned integer 8 with a value of 1. Then we are uh, writing an unsigned integer 32 with the player ID because we don't know how big that that player ID is going to be. So UN32 is a pretty big number. Then finally we're writing that entire message um, along the sockets and we're writing that piece of the buffer. If we cannot listen anymore, then it means that for some reason the server has encountered an error and it cannot listen for incoming connections, and then it's going to end the game and exit. All right, go to the game end. Whenever the game ends, it's going to destroy all instances of object player. It's going to destroy the listening socket, and it's going to destroy the buffer, because you no longer need those in memory. And then in draw, as before, it's just going to draw a whole lot of red players. And if they've started, it's going to draw their circles and whatnot. And if we go into object player over here, it's just in... Uh, initializes a whole lot of variables to zero and false. When we destroy it, it's going to destroy its socket. Remember, we're giving it a socket, so we need to destroy that. Then in the step here, this is where it gets all the information from the client side. I'm going to extend this. Notice we are setting up some variables. SA, message and new name. If the player has started, we're going to clear the buffer. We're going to write an unsigned integer 8 with value 2. It says here, don't send the data if the write buffer is already very large. So it's going to write all the data unless it gets to the end right, of the, of the amount that it can get, which is amount it can send, which is 4,000, that we defined in the constants of the server resources. Go into define constants. There'll be quite a few of them here. I'm going to find out where it put this. Exit that for now. There it is. Register login. I don't exactly know why this is here. I think he decided that he was going to do some sort of login system, but just never did eventually. But anyway, this is what we're interested in right here. Limit write data length, 2,000. Max write data length, 4,000. Right over there. So those are those numbers. Go back to the step. Make that bigger. Uh, so where were we? Yeah. So if it's less than um, the limit, then we're going to tell that object player if its ID is not the same as the other, the other object player IDs then we're going to write its ID, we're going to write its X and Y, we're going to write its H speed, and we're going to write its V speed. So on the client side, it's going to compare this ID to all the players, the remote players there, and say, well, if this remote player's ID is equal to the one being received, then we can give it all this information. Then finally, after all that's done, we're going to write the message along the socket, and we're writing that buffer. And here, before we're reading stuff from the clients, we're going to update read on the socket. And we always call that before we go into this while loop. Then again, we are, while well, we can read messages on that socket and then using that buffer. Oops. And we open up this over here, this block, this while block. It's getting that very first unsigned integer from the buffer and it's switching on it. So if we get a one from the client, it means the client's name is whatever we get and it's started and now we can send all the other player IDs of everyone else that's joined as well as telling other players that this player has joined and if it's a 2 then we're just updating um, some some values there of each client and then again here we're getting s equals 4 or 5 etc you know destroy it tell this player that you know tell the other players that this player is left etc and then we're handling some delay stuff down there we'll go okay go to end step again socket update write always done in the end step after we've done reading we do writing and um, here the x and y is just depending on delays and whatnot don't have to worry about that okay so that is everything i've gone through the client and the server so now i'm going to go through it in real time the way things would really work okay step one we open up the server over here server controller is created as we can see in this room there it is at the top option controller there is no local players in this room it's just the server so we create the server over here it's going to create the listening socket it's going to listen to 
um, that listening socket and it's going to be on the IPv4 at that obviously that port and it's going to be looking on the internet. It's going to create a buffer, it's going to increment its ID counters and step counters, set that to zero. Then in the step over here it's going to say well now we're listening. Okay, now we're listening. So that's listening right at the moment. Then we start a client. The client is going to have this object controller and when this one is created here in the create event it's going to set up some stuff. Here it says you know it's getting some information from the user where we want to connect, create that socket, then I'm going to connect See this? Socket connect, socket address port false. It's going to connect that and create its own buffs and stuff. So as soon as we get there, so socket create, this thing's going to say, oh, now we've got someone that, you know, needs some service. So it's going to increment its player ID counter. It's going to create the object player. The socket, it's going to listen to that socket from now on. It's going to give that guy an IP, a name, and a player ID and whatnot. Then it's going to send, it's going to clear the buffer and send a one. Now, if you're wondering where that one goes, close this over here, go back to step, in the step. You can ignore all this down here, get to line 22, while socket read message. This is a message that it's sending out. It gets to here and update reads from the socket. So if it gets to line 20, and something from the server has been sent to the client, it's going to say, hey, we've got some... We've got, you know, we've got a message. We're reading it now from the socket, and this is the buffer. So then it's going to extract the first unsigned um, integer from the buffer, which in this case, over here on the server, was a 1 over there. So it's going to switch on that 1, and in this case it says case 1. If we receive a 1, which we are in this case, then we are setting object local player's player ID to the, ve the very next value, h, uh, h buffer read 32, if you look over here, un32, player ID. Now do notice this is a very, very important thing. The way we send data is the exact same way that we read the data. So if we write a float and then we write an integer and then we write a string, in the server or in the client where we're reading, we have to read it in the same order. We have to read the first float, then we have to read the integer, then we have to read the string. If you start messing it around and changing the order, you're not going to get the right information and things are going to go very, very wrong. So make sure when you send data, the types of data you send, you also receive them in the same order. Remember that. Okay, so in this case, we've sent that one. We've told, well, this one signifies that it's setting the player ID of the local player. In this case, this is the person actually playing the game. They get this UN32, which in this case is their ID, and we set up that ID. Okay, so that's done. That's done. And uh, here's just saying, well, you know, we can't read. So that's that part. Now, the player on the client side has an ID. Go back to the create over here. We notice that here at the bottom, after being created and setting up its name, then um, it assigns that name that the player entered to the, the name of the local player. Then over here it says, well, now that we've got the name, we're going to send that off to the server. So first we are cleaning up the buffer, make sure there's nothing in there except the data that I'm about to put into it. Then we're going to write a uint8 of value 1 to the server. And then after that we're going to write the string of our name. Finally, we're going to write that message you know, to that socket, we're writing that buffer, that big chunk of information. Going back here to the controller, notice we go into the object player now because he is created. Um, let's find out where we created him. Over here, remember, he was created as soon as we had a connection. So now that he's created, this object player is going to be handling a lot of his own data. Um, so here we're getting a 1. If we go into the step, open this on the side again, um, he's sending some stuff, don't worry, we'll get to that. Line 24, while we can read a message, first we're updating the read. So this sends a thing saying, yeah, we're sending data. Then when it gets to line 22, it updates to check if there's any incoming data. And then when it gets to 24, it says, yeah, there is some incoming data. In this case, it's that one coming in. It extracts the one, H buffer read, uint8. Notice that one's a uint8. It's reading the uint8. So it's writing, it's reading the same data type. Then it's switching on that one. And in this case, it's saying, well, if we get a one, which we are getting. It's going to extract the name from the first string over here. There it is. It's extracting the name. Now that's all the data we needed. We just needed this uint8 and the string. And then now we can say, well, now the player has started. He is ready to send and receive data from all kinds of sources. So now that that's done, we need to tell the player that's just joined and set up that there are other people on the server and here's their information. So with the current object players over here, with object player, 
if that object player, notice because on the server everyone playing is an instance of object player, back over here, if this person, this particular object player, has started and its ID is not the same as the ID we've just got over here from this connection, we're going to clear the buffer, we're going to send a uint3, we're going to send the player ID, and we're going to send the name, and finally we're adding all that, appending all that to the buffer, and in the end we are writing that buffer to everyone else's socket, other than the socket that we received from the... Uh, remember, see this is object player. So every other socket, every other instance of object player is going to be getting this this packet of information. Okay, then over here, tell this tell the other players that this player has joined. So here it again, it's saying, well, every other player, um, if they've started and the ID is not the same as this ID, we are writing a, a uint8 with the value 3, we are sending a uint32 which has the player ID, everyone else's player ID, and their name, and we're writing this to the socket global buffer over there. That's all we're doing if we receive a 1. Now we go back over here to the client, over here, uh, client step, so now it's receiving 3, go down to line 22, it's extracting the 3 using h buffer read uint h from the global buffer. It's switching on that A value, which in this case is 3, so it's not 1, it's not 2, it's over here, it's 3. It's creating a remote player, right over there. It's going to, remember, right at the top, we've got a temporary variable A. Remember, when you can either put it at the top, or if this gets too confusing, you can remove it from there. And then, over here, for example, you could have var A. But notice how we use A so many times, so you might as well just put it up here. Um, okay, so we are creating an instance of ob object remote player, assigning its ID to this variable A. We are giving it its server ID, which is the player ID over here. Notice that was that value. After we get the 3, the next value was a UN32. There it is. Server ID. Then the last value was the name, right over there. And that's it. So both of these things sent to there. Then once that's done, what else do we do? Okay, that's good. All good. Once those are done, that handles the connection of different players. Then if you go back into object controller over here, this object controller is saying, after doing some delay stuff, which we don't have to worry about, it's going to constantly, every step, send the position and speed of the local player. So this is the person actually physically playing the game. So again, clears the buffer. It sends a uint8 with a value 2, puts that into that global buffer. Then with the actual lo local player, if the ID is not equal to other ID, this is always a good thing to put there just in case it gets confused with all kinds of things. We're going to write its X, we're going to write its Y, we're going to write the H speed, we're going to write the V speed, close that up, and then write the message to the socket, uh, write the, the buffer to the socket there using socket write message. So that's a 2. Go back here into object player, into step, find a 2, 1, 2, over here. Client delay start equals true, delay equals minus 1, again it's delay stuff. Then here it's getting the x, the y, the h speed, and the v speed in the correct order. First we send the x, it extracts the x. Then we send the y, it extracts the y. Send the h speed, it extracts the h speed. Uh, send the v speed, it extracts, extracts the v speed. Notice how it does all that. This happens every single step. Whenever you want to send the data, make sure that it's just out there in the step event. It's going to be sending this all the time. And I'll show you in the end, it's, it's pretty reliable. And um, yeah, latency isn't that crazy. Looks very responsive. So that's the way it sends the player information. And then finally we write that as explained. Now, whenever a player leaves, we can find that. Uh, let's go here. Um, game end. What does it do? Nothing. Just destroy stuff. Yeah, let's end the step. Back over here. Oh, another thing, go back to the top of the step event of object player. And this is going to say that every step, as long as this object player has started, clear the buffer, write it value of 2. And um, again, we're checking how big the buffer is because this can be a lot of information that we want to send at once. In this case, it should be fine. So with object player, if our ID is not the same as the uh, ID of some of the others, then send the ID, send the XY, and the H speed, and the V speed. Now notice this is a 2. Now if we look here in the object controller, step 2 is for remote players. Check that out. So basically we're saying 
um, that if the ID right, is not the same as the other ID, so for every player that isn't the same player as the one requesting um, you know, to update remote players, send them this piece of information. So that's why automatically it's going to come to a 2 and it's going to move the remote players because according to this little interaction it's having, it expects to get in information that relates to the remote players and not the actual object local player. So in this case it's you know sending the the ID, the X, the Y, the client H speed, V speed, and then in this case here, number two, this is delay stuff again, it's saying while uh, the buffer is not at the end, it's going to start reading. In the first case, it's the ID, which is the UN32, then it's getting the X, the Y, the HS, the VS, uh, whoops, over there, and it's, you know, it's putting those into the temporary variables at the top, see that's in there. Then it's saying with object remote player, if the ID of this remote player is the same as the one that we actually are talking about, then update that one's variables with these ones that we have grabbed. Right over there. Okay. And then ultimately, when the player dies, um, here it's just saying, well, this is where, this it's a UN32, that's the, the player ID, and if we look at the remote player, and if its ID is the same as the value we're getting, then destroy that instance. It's rather simple if you think of it. Um, in the greater scale of things. It's it's very, very easy to understand. So, basically, every step, the client is sending data to the, the server, and the server is replying and servicing all those requests. We're always updating, well, the player is always telling his position to the server, and the server is sending that position to every client connected. So I'm going to run this right now. And I, can, I can show you what it looks like, make sure we've saved both of these. Right over there. Okay, saved, saved. I'm going to run this, run the server. Okay, the server's done. This is the server. It's just a black screen for now. It's not exactly that great. It's not telling whoever's running the server if it's actually running, but it is running. Um, then here, this is the client. It says, where do we want to connect? In this case, we want to connect to the loopback address because that's where the server is currently being held, right here on the same machine. Click OK. Name. GP, click OK. Delay server, no. Bam, there we go. This is the client on the right. This is the server. Now, you don't have to display, um, you know, everyone running the game. So, example, if in your server you want to have all the statistics, how much information is being sent and received, you can do that. That's it's quite exciting. You don't have to have any graphical instances of uh, the players. They can all be invisible. So, here on the right, we have me. I move around. It sends it right there to the server. See, and below that's got my IP, it's just the loop, local loopback. So now if I run another client, which I'm going to do now, open up, there it is, uh, open up another client, over here, it's going to have exactly the same code, push play, minimize that, so we can still move around, the server is still running. Again, going to the loopback, we're going to call this guy Steve, say OK, no, Steve will not use delay, whoop, Steve popped into the room, look at that! See? On the right here, we've got me, JP. Then at the bottom left, we've got Steve. Notice he's red on the screen. And then in the server, you've got Steve and JP both hanging out over there. Very simple. So every step, my object is sending its XY coordinates to the server. The server is saying, it's getting all that information, and now it's saying, well, I need to update all the clients with this information. So it grabs that information, then it sends that information back to every um, player ID that is not the same as my little one moving. In this case, it is Steve. So Steve receives that information and it updates his remote player with my name. See? So Steve sees me moving around. And on his screen, I'm a, an instance of object remote player. And he's an instance of object player. And on my screen over here on the right, he is an instance of object remote player, and I'm an instance of object local player. Now, to beef this up a, a bit, I'm going to add some, um, you know, instance um, image angle to it. So, basically, I'm going to be able to move around and point the mouse somewhere, and then this thing's going to rotate, and we're going to send that information also to the server, and then it's going to update all the remote player objects 
you know, all in real time. It's going to be pretty excellent. And doing that, we're going to learn a little bit more of how the server and the clients communicate. And with that, you'll be able to, well, you'll will have the understanding of how to send your custom data in any way you choose. So to do that, we're going to be doing that in the next tutorial or the one after the, well, maybe I can do it in the, the port forwarding one. But anyway, I can't do that right now. We're probably way over time. So this is probably going to be a massive amount of time gone in this tutorial. But we'll be doing that the next up. If you have any questions related to this, I know it's a lot to digest right at this present time, please feel free to put something in the description or on my um, channel discussions. Go for it. I can answer a whole lot of questions. And also, in the description, there is the project files for the client and server, and you'll be able to play them exactly. You know, just download them and then extract them, and then you can play them, and you can fiddle around with the way this works. Maybe add your own sprites, see if you can get that sending through, or you can even attempt to send your own image angle. And but we will be going through that in the next tutorial. But I do encourage you to fiddle around, and then also go over here to Martin's actual documentation and read through all the functions that we went through in greater detail. Um, you might also be interested in the types. If we go to buffers, uh, not buffers. It's yeah, it's buffers. Uh, the types of information over here. So you might need to know exactly how much, um, well, which data type to use. For example, when we sent the tag, we just used a, a uint8, which was 0 to 255, because, I mean, you'll have up to 255 different things you could do. I mean, if you send 0 also. Um, you have 256 things you can uh, different things you can do for example logging in registering moving the player moving the remote players it's it's never ending you know so there's more than enough information in a uint8 to send the tags then for example for our player movement we used a float32 so check that out that's a lot of information that we can send in there each one every float32 we send is four bytes um, of physical space we're sending through the network then the string, obviously, depending on the length of the string, we've got length plus one. If you're going to be sending, for example, a sprite index, I highly suggest you instead uh, send a uint8, and then on the server side and the client side, you use another switch to determine exactly which um, sprite resource that is. Because if you send the sprite resource as a string, you can see that is going to take a lot of information, and it's going to slow things down eventually. So where you can, use as a primitive data type as possible and then just use the server and client sides to um, you know work out what exactly that data means so it's it's a lot faster so that wraps up the basics of the movement and client servers um, I hope you enjoyed this tutorial I know it was extremely complicated and for that I do apologize but it's just something you've got to go through and eventually you'll understand it now next tutorial we we're going through port forwarding and then as I mentioned before we're going to be adding uh, image angle to that then finally we're going to be doing some um, account management so for example when the servers when the player creates it's going to um, create an a, a, well an instance of object player but it's not going to display it it's not going to give that player any anything but that instance and then once the player logs in then it's going to assign it um, some variables and whatnot to say that well it's finally in now send it started to everyone else. So that's coming very, very soon. So I hope you found this tutorial educational and helpful. Please feel free to comment, rate, and subscribe. If you're feeling generous, you can buy me a beer or coffee sometime. Keeps me going, I guess. Huh? And um, projects are in the description. Download those and fiddle around. Check out Martin Burt's um, official documentation. Go through all the functions. Make sure you understand it to a basic level, I guess. And I will see you guys next time for a great game maker tutorial. Coming up next time, port forwarding. Stay tuned.